Okay, chapter 20 covers various techniques that are used uh, that take advantage of DNA technology um, to solve various problems. And let's go through some of these. So, um, it starts with um, DNA cloning in which we're going to use, in this case, a bacterium to clone a gene from some other organism, a human perhaps, and um, you're taking advantage of something that bacteria often have, these, these plasmids, which are extra pieces of DNA that's separate from their main chromosome. These plasmids, as we see, as we'll see when we study bacteria uh, a little later, can move between um, bacteria. Uh, under the right conditions, one bacterium can take up a plasmid that's in the surroundings um, around it. And so what we're doing is um, we're going to engineer a plasmid that has the gene of interest to us and get a bacterium to take it up. And then when that bacterium divides, we're essentially making copies of that gene, or essentially cloning it inside these bacteria. And so we can be creating clones of bacteria, and the gene might be one that's used in addressing human health issues, one that's involved with uh, environmental issues, and it could be perhaps a gene that's used to um, um, that bacterium can be one that moves that gene then into uh, plants. <clears throat> and so through all of this and with the many techniques we're talking about in this chapter, we're creating what we call recombinant DNA. That is, we're combining the DNA of different organisms into new combinations. Um, and through this, we're essentially doing what can generally be called genetic engineering. We're going beyond traditional breeding techniques and moving genes between organisms, between organisms that it would be impossible to do this with using traditional breeding techniques. Traditional breeding techniques are restricted to organisms that can essentially mate with each other. And clearly something like a bacterium and a plant can't do that, or a human and a bacterium. So we're going to use these other techniques to move these genes around. Now an important tool in um, doing this are what are known as restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are produced by bacteria, and their job is to cut DNA at specific spots. And bacteria have these as sort of a defensive mechanism. You'll recall that phages uh, infect a host bacterial cell by injecting their DNA and sort of taking over the host. Well, bacteria can use restriction enzymes to try to neutralize that viral DNA, that foreign DNA. We have learned to take advantage of these restriction enzymes in biotechnology. So, for example, here's a restriction enzyme that recognizes this particular sequence and cuts the DNA in this zigzag fashion, creating what are known as sticky ends or unpaired ends on these new pieces of DNA. And we'll see how we can essentially take a different piece of DNA that was cut out with the same restriction enzyme. Its sticky ends will match up with the other piece, and you can insert the new piece essentially in the other piece because the sticky ends match up because you've used the restrict same restriction enzymes. Um, this particular sticky end, or this particular combination of bases is, if I remember correctly, yes, is created by 
a restriction enzyme called ECOR1, which this stands for E. coli restriction site 1. And there's all sorts of these um, restriction enzymes, many hundreds of them, if not thousands, I'm not sure exactly how many. But they all cut DNA at different parts, many with sticky ends, others just cut straight across without sticky ends. But the sticky end ones are quite useful. So, for example, here we have these, this plasmid from bacterium, and here we have a hummingbird cell, and we're going to get some DNA out of this hummingbird. We're going to cut the plasmid with a particular restriction enzyme and cut the DNA from the hummingbird with the same restriction enzyme so that they have sticky ends that match up. We're going to go through the technique of transformation and essentially we're trying to get the plasmids to take up these pieces of hummingbird DNA and different plasmids will take up different pieces because we're just cutting up the whole genome of the hummingbird with this restriction enzyme so we're creating thousands of pieces. Um, some of the plasmids will not take up any pieces and so they are the non-recombinant types but the recombinant ones are that are the taken up, have taken up foreign DNA, in this case some hummingbird DNA. And so then we're going to use the process of transformation to get other bacterial cells to take up these plasmids. And so you'll notice sort of another part of the technique is here is that this plasmid has this particular gene on it called the LAC-Z gene. And um, this LAC-Z gene, under the right conditions in a culture, will turn blue. Okay. Well, where a plasmid has taken up one of these foreign pieces of DNA, essentially that foreign piece has been inserted in the middle of this LAC-Z gene, essentially disabling the gene. So those colonies, which start as a single cell, but then grow into a colony of thousands of cells, or millions even, they will not turn blue, so we know those colonies have taken up the foreign uh, DNA. Now, another part of these plasmids that can come in handy is they have an ampicillin resistance gene. Ampicillin is a antibiotic and so you can find out not all of these bacterial cells will take up a plasmid whether it's recombinant or non-recombinant some of them just won't take it up if they don't take it up they don't have the gene for ampicillin resistance and so you can essentially screen all the colonies on your culture here by using ampicillin and bacteria that were not transformed will not grow so the only colonies that grow are the ones that have taken up a plasmid. The only ones that are not blue are the ones that have taken up um, a plasmid that has been trans that has recombinant DNA in it. So there's a couple different screening techniques going on. You can then take some individuals of each of these little colonies, literally scrape them off, and you can begin culturing individual colonies that will have separate um, of the genes that have come from the hummingbird. And so you can essentially create these what are called genomic libraries or batches of bacteria that all have the same gene that they've taken up. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So now, how are we going to find? which of those which of those genomic libraries has which gene in it what we can use are called complementary dna's c dna's and so here what you do is you're going to isolate from your original organism from the hummingbird in this case you're going to isolate mrnas from cells of that organism all right so these are finished mRNAs that are ready to be used to make proteins. All right, we're going to use reverse transcription to basically create some DNA from those mRNAs. 
All right. So we create one side with DNA. We use some enzymes to remove the mRNA. And then we use some polymerase to create some double-stranded complementary DNA. All right. So what we do then is we have essentially our clones and we have these trays with these tiny little wells in them and each one represents a different clone and so we can take our separate cDNAs all right and we can essentially create a probe a radioactive probe that matches up and is complementary to a particular cDNA and we can take a particular probe for a particular stretch of DNA and we can apply it to our well. We essentially have, we, we bathe our wells, our tray of wells with all our different uh, clones in there, our bacterial clones. And we're going to do, this is called nucleic acid hybridization. We're going to get our probe to stick to the appropriate piece of DNA in all of our clones. So we can find out which of our clones has incorporated a particular gene in it by having the complementary radioactive piece of DNA stick to it. And um, so once you've hybridized it, it sticks to that particular clone. Then you essentially um, store it uh, with some film and the radiation essentially exposes the film and so it will show you where the clone is that has taken up that um, particular gene. And so this is how you find out which of your clones has taken up which particular gene. It's a rather laborious process, but once you find out, it can be very useful because then you know this clone, these clones of bacteria have this particular gene, and it may be a gene that can be quite, quite useful. You can also use, in addition to radioactive probes, you can use these fluorescent probes where um, the complementary piece, instead of being radioactive, it fluoresces and can show you which clone has which gene. All right, last thing, uh, polymerase chain reaction. So this is a very important technique invented by this guy named Kerry Mullis. This was back in the 80s. Um, so it's been around a while. It's an extremely influential, important process and made Kerry Mullis a, a rich man because of it, because he patented this technique. And um, so it's a technique where you can make many copies of a particular target sequence of DNA. And what you do is you take um, the genomic DNA, the whole genome of the organism, you heat it up to denature it. This is it as a relatively high temperature, usually about 94 degrees C. Then you cool it down to somewhere, say, around 60, whoops, that's supposed to be a 6, 64 degrees C. And this is the annealing step. And you have primers. And these are RNA primers, which are specific to the target sequence you want to copy. Then you have the extension phase. And you usually heat that up a bit somewhere around 72 to 74 degrees C. And you have polymerase in there that will then make copies of your target sequence of DNA. Uh, one of the key innovations that, or ideas that Mullis had, was that he used DNA polymerase, whoops, DNA polymerase, from an organism where the polymerase can handle these high temperatures. Human DNA polymerase cannot handle these high temperatures. But he used what can be known as TAC polymerase, which came from an organism um, called Thuringiensis aquaticus, which is a bacterium that grows in hot springs whose DNA can handle these conditions. Now, you, cre you repeat this many, many times, and essentially you're creating many, many copies, specifically after a few steps, you start to make a lot of the target. And then from then on, you're making a whole bunch of these target copies. And you can make millions of them at a time.